But again, it's no different than the early days of the internet. You, you got to remember that there was a time when people said, don't use Amazon because your credit card is going to get hacked. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban is an American billionaire entrepreneur, television personality, and media proprietor whose net worth is an estimated $4.7 billion, according to Forbes, and ranked no. 177 on the 2020 Forbes 400 list. In this video, Mark Cuban talks about all major altcoins and Bitcoin, scams in the sector, and much more on predictions and his preferences. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. A new lawsuit accuses Dallas Mavericks owner and billionaire Shark Tank investor Mark Cuban of partnering with now bankrupt crypto platform Voyager Digital to dupe investors in a massive Ponzi scheme. The class action suit, filed in federal court in southern Florida on behalf of millions of investors, alleges that 3.5 million Americans lost over $5 billion in cryptocurrency assets through Voyager. Voyager temporarily suspended all trading and withdrawals on its platform on July 1, shortly before filing for bankruptcy in New York on July 5, listing both assets and liabilities between $1 billion and $10 billion. Voyager users are waiting to see if they will get their money back when the company comes out of bankruptcy, either on its own or with a new owner. Cuban's NBA team and Voyager CEO Stephen Ehrlich are also listed as defendants. The lawsuit said Cuban, Ehrlich, and the Mavs should pay the victims back. The Mavs announced a five-year partnership with Voyager in 2021 that made it the team's first cryptocurrency brokerage and international partner. Fans were given a limited deal where if they deposited $100 and traded at least $10 by the end of the month, they got a $100 reward. The influx of new users was so great that Voyager added a waitlist. Cuban and Ehrlich, as will be explained, went to great lengths to use their experience as investors to dupe millions of Americans into investing, in many cases their life savings, the lawsuit claimed. Cuban did not immediately respond to the Dallas Morning News request for comment on the lawsuit. It's, it's not, yes, it, it does concern me, but it doesn't diminish my bullishness on crypto. Um, you know, if you go back over the last few years, um, you know, let's just go back 2020. Um, we saw the DeFi summer and that brought a lot of new people in and it created a lot of applications that particularly for Ethereum and some L2s that really got people involved and brought people to the table for Ethereum in particular. And those applications make total sense. You know, you go on Aave and you put some money in, you deposit, you borrow, it takes 30 seconds. You know, you need to pull out some USDC to go pay a credit card bill. And now you can do that, right? So DeFi went from being something new that brought a lot of people in. People were using their stimulus checks. Rates were really high back then. You, can, you could yield farm and it was crazy as everybody was figuring it out. You had a lot of investor money coming in, subsidizing yields. And so you really had... Um, you, you had this groundswell of people coming to crypto and that was great. It was a unique application that really put people to work. Then you saw the same thing with NFTs. People started collecting them, whether it was on Flow with um, Top Shot or it was on Ethereum with, you know, Punks or whatever, you know, Bored Apes, whatever it may be. And everything and anything was being created and everything sold at the beginning, right? But, you know, and that brought in a ton of people, still brought in a ton of people. So you had NFTs as a cool application that led to utilization. Because the thing about crypto that I think people sometimes fail to realize is you need users in order for people to buy and use the Ethereum or whatever it may be, right, to generate gas fees. Because if gas fees aren't being generated or application fees aren't being generated, there's no real business there. And at the end of the day, it's still a real business that has to sustain itself. And so that got me in again. So, you know, it really is going to take that next big thing to really drive utilization. That's so that's my concern, you know, and, you know, I've said this before, we saw the same thing with the internet, you know, streaming, bam, it's fun. New websites, bam, it's fun. Amazon, you're buying, bam, it's fun. 
And then, you know, everything kind of cratered in 2000 and 2001. And there were no BAMs for a long time, <laughs> you know? There wasn't shit happening for a few years. And then, you know, in 2004, you saw Facebook and social networks hit. And then you saw um, app stores hit, you know, when in 2007 when um, the iPhone came out. So we're, we're looking for that app store, iPhone, you know, platforming moment where there's new applications that bring in a lot of non-traditional crypto users. Because, you know, the, the, the thing that's going to drive crypto above and beyond just the cryptoites is something where you just have to use it. SEC is incredibly hypocritical. You know, they talk about um, trying to protect investors. Do you guys know what the pink sheets are? Like a car? No, no, not for a car. Pink sheets are little um, public equities stocks that don't trade on the, the the big exchanges like the NASDAQ or the New York Like stocks. the penny stocks. Penny stocks, but penny stocks can be different types. There's over-the-counter penny stocks and there's pink sheet penny stocks. And they're not necessarily all penny stocks. They can be big companies um, like Luck. What was the coffee um, company out of China that turned into a scam, Luckin Coffee or whatever. Mm. But anyways, um, they trade over there too. Well, there are, I just looked at this yesterday because some or two days ago because someone asked me. There are 16,750 pink sheet stocks. Right about probably about the number of tokens there are probably, right? There is no protection for anybody anywhere coming from the SEC and that already falls under their purview, right? They're supposed to be protecting you. There are um, funds, ETFs and others that um, incorporate stocks from countries that have no um, no SEC like protections at all. They don't care. You can still buy them and sell them, right? There are companies that are bought and sold on big exchanges that have no audit rights whatsoever. You don't have any idea if the numbers are accurate. And so when the SEC comes in and says, they want to protect investors from crypto they're, they're not even doing their job with what the area they're supposed to do their job you know the sec does this thing called um, regulation through litigation meaning they don't come out and say here's the rules that we want everybody to follow give us your comments they do what they did with coinbase they sue right and they'll sue you and their hope is that um the result of the lawsuit is then turns into precedent that they're able to use to enforce the way they want to enforce it. It's not like someone today could just call the SEC and say, okay, we want to issue a token. We have this, you know, crypto business. Tell us what we need to do. There's just no way. And so as a result, there's all this uncertainty, which is why you see more um, crypto companies in Singapore and the Bahamas and the British Virgin Islands. Um, in Caymans, all these different places, and people are afraid to do anything here. And now you look at the big companies like Coinbase who create jobs and are trying to do it right. They're getting fucked over. To me, it's unfortunate. Obviously, you don't want to be the person losing money. But again, it's no different than the early days of the internet. You, you got to remember that there was a time when people said, don't use Amazon because your credit card is going to get hacked. You know, don't do any buying on the internet because you're putting at risk your credit card. So it's, it's part of the learning curve. And every time people get smarter and they learn from experience, it's just because of the scale already of crypto, it, it, it can be expensive and unfortunate. Recent headline we saw is Michael Saylor stepped down from CEO to take a executive position to still to focus on Bitcoin. Do you think that story we're getting is truly face value what happened? Do you think he was pushed out? Do you think he chose to? I have no idea and I really don't care. I don't think it changes anything for anything. Right. Probably the greatest takeaway now that I think about it, if you look across just general business and you look across crypto, um, Web3, if you want to call it that, um, metaverse, it all comes down to community. Where can you create community and what's the impact of that community? Your community might be, you know, you, you know, you guys and your um uh, you know, your organization, the people you bring in, right? It could be the community for the Dallas Mavericks, it could be just community within VR using an avatar. There's a thousand ways to create community and technology is going to have a growing impact on that community. Whichever platforms make 
the strongest communities will be one type of metaverse. The, the communities, whichever platform creates the largest um, community will have another type of metaverse, if you will. And so it won't be just one size fits all. There'll be a lot of different applications and a lot of ways of defining the metaverse. Um, but right now it's more talk than anything. And the worst part is people are buying real estate in these places. I mean, that's just the dumbest shit ever. The dumbest, dumbest. Did I say it was dumb? No, that, that's not strong enough. Super meta, immaculately dumb. You know, it's just like if, you know, it's not even as good as a URL or, you know, an ENS, be, you know, because there's unlimited volumes that you can create. Now, after you create a community, not before, but after you create a community, then you can find places depending on how that community works that can have perceived value because of access or whatever, right? But beforehand, based off of a traditional real estate model, dumbest motherfucking shit ever. To, to buy a Klima token, a, an MCO token, a BCT token and burn it and take the treasury back out, you know, and, and take that as an offset, right? And they make it easy to do. You know, now you can look at it as uh, an investment and there's upside to it if this happens a lot, but the, the worst case, which is the way I, I also try to look at things is, worst case is I just burn them and based off their treasury that I've burned, I've offset X amount of tons of carbon. And to me, that's a win no matter how you look at it. And so they're still early in the game. They've, they've you know made some missteps, but I think that they've really gotten their act together. Like Polygon came in and, and bought a bunch and as a result, you know offset their footprint for their proof of stake um, network. And I think more and more companies will do that. And so that's a low market cap one that I like. Excuse me, um, KLIMA. Um, what was the other one I have? Wait here, I'll tell you real quick. Give me. Nice. Um, free, um, NX. Oh, it's long. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I was interested. <laughs> now you're interested. I was <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can find it. There we go, Matt, Klima. I own, I own Klima, I own Ape, I own some BLT, Blockto, because it's, um, um, while it's for Flow, Injective, um, Aletha, which is the um, integrating artificial intelligence to, um, to NFT. So that's probably the other one. And I like Ocean as well. And so, you know, the Alita, if you can start integrating um, AI to, into NFTs and are able to create some virtual humans, if you will, that have different properties and that expands and you can have some fun with that and unique applications. And then Ocean, you know, for, for packaging data and buying and reselling it so that there's ongoing um, rewards to the people who originate the data. They haven't really executed as well as I would have liked, but that's the concept. Um, ETH has been my most successful by far, um, with Bitcoin right behind. Um, I did really well with Helium, um, but, and, I, and I sold right at the top. I got lucky, you know. And, and in terms of one I missed out on, none that I really wish, you know, because I got in early enough that a lot of them were really cheap. I could take flyers, you know, buying Polygon and under a penny you know, those types of things. So there hasn't really been one that I've truly missed out. Now I've timed some of them wrong. I lightened up on a bunch of stuff and um, on Ethereum and Bitcoin. So I lightened up and some I got out really well and some, I you know, um, um, I sold lower than where it is now, but that's okay. The timing of the Mavs Voyager partnership was less than ideal. It launched just weeks before digital currencies peaked in November before crashing. Since early November, the global market cap of cryptocurrencies has fallen from $2.9 trillion to $1.2 trillion. The lawsuit against Cuban follows a $258 million suit against Tesla CEO Elon Musk in June in which a Dogecoin investor accused him of running a pyramid scheme. Keith Johnson's lawsuit in Manhattan 
accused Musk of using his contacts, including Cuban, to boost the price of Dogecoin. Earlier this year, Cuban said on the Problem with Jon Stewart podcast that outside of his Shark Tank investments, 80% of his investments are in or around cryptocurrencies. In a recent episode of a Full Send podcast, Cuban didn't waver on his confidence in the industry. I'm still bullish on crypto, he said on the podcast. Obviously, it's way down right now. I took a hit. Everyone took a hit on crypto. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.